There we go. Hello, attendees. Just giving you a few seconds for people to come on. I'm just giving a few minutes. Yeah, By the way, I'm Christine Nicholas. And this is my friend Parag. Oh. Okay, so in the essence of time, as, as many of our um, people have subscribed or joining to uh, kind of paint a picture, again, I'm Christine Nicholas, CEO and founder of People Science. I'm here with my friend Parag Vaish. This has been a, what, 10 months in the coming this webinar. I know that there's a lot of people joining the call today who heard parts of the story through me um, and that have asked for this webinar. And, and let me just describe to who will be joining as participants in the webinar. It's, it's myself, it's Parag, Jessica Roberto, our Director of Process Engineering will jump on to monitor questions um, and just some housekeeping issues. So if we're on Zoom, um, down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's an icon with a Q and an A on it. Just push that to submit questions. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I met Parag. Parag's gonna tell his story, which I was just saying to him, it's a great story. It's, it's a great story, Parag. Um, Jess will collect questions throughout the webinar and, and um, while we're talking, and then we'll present the questions at the end. I should let you know too that the webinar is being recorded. It's our intention to send a copy to all the participants. Feel free to circulate it because we think the more, the more you know. Uh, also, if you'd like to share your name, that's great for the Q&A. If you want to remain, remain anonymous, you can do that too. Uh, just giving them a few more minutes because we've got quite a few people jumping on. Okay. And just before I start to talk about how I met Parag, this is a book that he, when did, when did you write this? When was this published? This is about a year ago, a little more. What, really? Yeah, yeah, it was so I, I must've got it hot off the press, right? Yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a great read. Now, remembering that most of us, um, and I'll go over who's, who's attending today in a second, but most of us are coming from human resources or supplier diversity. Parag's not that, right? And that's one of the, the big interest points. But this book actually gave me some good ideas that we've already implemented here. So I, I strongly suggest it. Uh, so let's talk about the composition of, of who's joining. So we've got CEOs, CHROs, just about every title under the sun in human resources, supplier diversity, and advocates of diversity. So it's a good array and, and we're all in good company. So here's how I, here's how I actually met Parag. Uh, for, we're here on the East Coast, by the way. Hello on the West Coast. Hope you're having a good lunch, Central. Um, it was 10 months ago, coming up on a year. And um, I was getting ready to leave here in New Jersey to head to our West Coast office. And we actually were sponsoring the Human Capital Institute's Diversity and Inclusion Conference. Um, so in preparation for that, I met with, with our strategy team. And those of you who don't know us, people science those three things. We, are, um, we do talent acquisition, advice, direction, solution. How do you get there from here? Diversity is a huge part of that. Um, and we are an RPO, recruitment process outsourcing. So we assume the parts of recruiting that companies would like us to take over. And we have a technology that tracks tiny metrics. So with that in mind, meeting with our strategy team, and we're talking about where our clients are in the diversity spectrum, gaining new talent um, with diversity and what we call innovation because of that direct link between diversity employment, diversity suppliership, and innovation. So we're talking, we're going over the clients and there's two that really stuck with me because they were similar yet different. So client A, we'll call it, was almost two years into a pretty robust diversity initiative and they had done pretty well. They had met their targeted goals, their percentage, but now we're coming up on a year when the first hires had taken place and the, the turnover rate was way too high. So now we know we have a change management issue here, right? On the flip side, and we'll say client B, not even six months into this huge hiring initiative focused on different types of candidates, they're getting through the pipeline, they're getting to the interview phase, but the offer rate is not where we need it to be. And what was really mind blowing is the exception rate. The acceptance rate was much lower than we wanted it to be. So two different companies, two different spaces, two different industries, by the way, both bottlenecking 
at this hiring manager acceptance internally, right? Which in, in our world, and I'm sure that most of my friends in, in HR have also gone through this, you know, if, if we can flip a switch or find a provider or find some type of technology that can cure the ailment, it's so much easier. When you hear the word change management, we know it's going to be a lot longer. And that was my head set, by the way, Prague. When I'm, I'm leaving for, for San Francisco with this like weight on my back of how, how are we going to help them meet deadlines? How are we going to get this done fast? I and mean, this is such an important topic because everybody's running behind in the innovation game, right? Um, so I head out to the West Coast. HCI was great. Two-day conference. I'm on my way out now. You know, I'm done. We're, we're getting towards the end. And as I'm leaving, one of the guys from HCI says to me, wait a minute. I know what you were looking for. I know you haven't been able to get a lot of answers. There's a guy taking the stage. He's not, he's not from diversity. He's from the business. So I open the door and there's Parag and cue your story. Thank you, Christine. So um, again, my name is Parag Vaish. Um, a little bit of context and background on me. So uh, I'm currently with Google. I've been with Google for about a year and four months. Um, prior to that was at Tesla. Um, from an other companies and brands perspective, so you have a full breadth of me. Um, I worked in the healthcare industry at a company called Athena Health, based out of Boston. Um, was leading digital product at StubHub uh, in San Francisco for about three years. Was at NBC News on the digital side. Uh, a startup that was acquired by HomeAway and subsequently Expedia. And uh, two divisions of Microsoft and two divisions of Disney over my time. So. I think what you'll see is that this is a compilation of experiences across uh, different sized companies, different industries in which those companies preside in, and a few different markets, whether it be Boston, Seattle, um, LA, or now the Bay Area. So I'm sure there's you know, forms of diversity that you know, people who would jump on this call might have uh, international experience. I don't have much of that, uh, but this is, this is my story. And so what Christine had, uh, had witnessed was, um, me conveying a story of my time at Tesla. And so I think the best way for me to describe that to this group is, um, is to just you know, try to put you in my shoes, you know, what I inherited and what I joined. So Tesla in, in roughly summer of 2017, it was a pretty tumultuous time. So this is um, the Model S and Model X were the two vehicles that were out in market uh, selling extremely well. And uh, the Model 3 was expected to be launched imminently and was going through some persistent delays, which many of you may remember. Um, it was always seemed to be, it was right around the corner one month away. So I get hired by um, the president of Tesla. And uh, this makes me one level removed from Elon Musk. And I was, the, the role that I was hired into was the head of digital product and design for Tesla. And so from a product perspective, what that means is any of the experiences that touch a digital asset. So the mobile app by which vehicle owners interact with their car, the buying experience that you have on the web um, to transact your vehicle, um, the retail stores that have touch screens and some components of the in-car experience as well. And the team that I inherited was a total size of eight people. That was eight. Um, Tesla's very lean. So it was very um, you know, few people in the organization. So eight is what I inherited. And um, I needed to build this competency of how you do digital product development um, at Tesla, which frankly, the company has not had at that point had not indexed on doing digital development extremely well. And so um, the president of the company hired me and said, you know, let's grow the team. Let's uh, develop this competency and do it in a formal environment. And frankly, the only way we're going to scale with Model 3 is that digital was going to be the, the key asset. So I... I you know, take a look at my team and meet these eight people. And I, I pick up on a few different tendencies, um, most of which are people are extremely overworked. Uh, much of uh, the commentary I heard from these people was that they don't necessarily know what exactly their job is. They were doing what needed to be done because somebody asked them to do it, but it wasn't necessarily because that was their job. And um, there was just generally a tendency of feeling a, a feeling of disgruntled behavior. I'm uh, not sure where it was coming from, Pro probably from being overworked, but only later did I realize it was, you know, also the economics of their deal, the compensation side. And so the composition of these eight people um, was uh, six male and two female and, uh, you know, started to figure out how do we grow the team. So I took out uh, job recs and started to recruit 
for talent. And what I found was that um, many of the folks we were attracting were definitely attracted to the Tesla brand, no doubt about it. Um, but then what I found is that they were turning down our offers, um, you know, seemingly because of compensation. So I started to dig into this and uh, understood that what we were offering candidates was not meeting the market rate on the compensation side. And that was because of all the past experiences I've had. I had a cross section of what it meant to be a product manager in healthcare, a product manager at StubHub in the technology world, you know, in Seattle at NBC News. So I had enough of a barometer for what compensation uh, should, should look like. And um, I, I started to approach our HR group and said, well, you know, I, I feel like I've got a problem here. Um, if, uh, if I've got a current existing team of eight people who are disgruntled, both from a compensation perspective, as well as because of uh, um, uh, they're overworked, they may leave the company. You know, and I may not also be able to attract people to join the company at the same time. So now I feel like my eight person team is not only at risk of contracting, that I may not be able to grow the team to what I think is commensurate to what we should be doing. And um, the first step on that journey in working with the HR team was that we needed to understand what was the job descriptions of each of these people. So I started by saying, let me organize each uh, level of job description in such a way that it was very clear what a level one, two, three, four, and five product manager meant, and same with design talent. And that was a, an unlocking moment because I basically looked at competencies of the job, and let's say there were 10, and then looked at you know, five levels of seniority, and then articulated what it meant to be uh, proficient if you are a level three product manager on say technical acumen, for example. And what it did was basically, basically allowed me to calibrate each person, you know, across this rank. And so now I was able to take those eight people and say, this person's a level two, this person's a level four and so on and so forth. Then in working with HR and the compensation team figured out what is the commensurate appropriate salary and equity and, you know, overall compensation for each of those respective levels. And so after all said and done, you know, we found what we thought was appropriate using some market data. What I realized was that um, those eight people, the two females were lowest on the list in terms of compensation. And so even though someone was, you know, adequately leveled based on my moniker of one, two, three, four, five, um, it seemed like there was something that was incorrect about the two females compensation because a level four male product manager and a level four female product manager were making vastly different compensation. So I said to the HR people, and again, keep in mind, I'm not from uh, the HR world or, uh, you know, anything in, in relation to diversity and inclusion. Um, I just said to the HR person, I said, while we're doing all this work to get the levels right and compensation right, why don't we solve for this, you know, gender pay gap as well? And, you know, the person said, well, you're the division lead. So um, if that's what you'd like to do, sure, let's do it. So then I basically standardized the compensation and a level four product manager, whether you're male or female or years of experience didn't matter, there was a certain rate. And the, the result of that for those two females was a 40% and a 66% pay increase for those two females. Wow. So, Imagine in your respective job that you occupy today, if somebody walked in the door and gave you, whether it be 40 or 66% pay increase that you didn't ask for, frankly, right? And it was just the math formula. So you can imagine how um, excited these two females were. And I got to do a sidebar moment. The, the woman who got a 66% pay increase, I, I have to believe she was 25% joking on the comment I'm about to make. She looked at me and said, you know, Parag, my husband works on the Model 3 production line, and this pay increase will have him making more than what he makes. Do you think you can reduce it down so that I make at least what he makes? She was asking for a reduction in that 66% pay increase. Now, again, I say 25% joking, right, which is still too high of a percentage, you know, if she was joking about it. Um, and I looked at her. Why? Did she elaborate why? She did not elaborate. And I, and I, fortunately, my response was very stoic. And I said to her, this is the job. This is the level of the job. And I believe you're, uh, you're, you're skilled at this level for this job. And this is what I'm paying for the job. I want, I want to ask you a tough question. And, and yeah. we didn't talk about this before, but it just kind of hit my brain. So I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm kind of putting you on the spot. 
when you were back in HR and you're looking at this disparity in pay, and here's these, these two women, did you for one second when you looked at that think, is this a lower performer because her salary is lower? Did that go through your head at all? Not one bit, Christine. I had worked with these people for about five, six weeks at that point. So you, so knew them. you knew them? I had them. enough. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was not uh, zero as a starting point. It was, you know, five or six weeks. Um, so, you know, it was a, a formula driven. And in fact, even in that HR discussion, you know, as I said to those folks, um, does anyone here have to approve this? Does it have to go to management? They said, no, you're the division head. You decide. And uh, at that moment, Christine, to your point about going back to that HR discussion, I, genuine, I genuinely felt like I would get fired for making this decision. Okay. The, the decision to change the, salary bands or? Change salary, salary bands and for leveling the, uh, the gender pay gap as well uh, because of the magnitude of pay increase for those two individuals, 40 and 66%. And not because, of the, not because of the impact on my team, but because it would be the only division of the company that is going through this exercise, okay? Mm -hmm. That it's not being done in a coordinated effort company-wide in such a way that the message can be managed and controlled and, you know, all that stuff. This is essentially, you know, my, you might as well call me a rogue division leader who's just doing whatever he wants, you know, to level compensation. And you can imagine other groups in the company possibly taking exception to this because now they would ask questions that they're not prepared to answer. You know, their people will be asking questions, not prepared to answer. But what I said to myself as I walked out of that room was if there's really anything that's worth getting fired over, this is probably the one, you know, there might be three things worth getting fired over. This is definitely one of those three things. And so I was willing to take that risk that if I got fired over it, that uh, I would be proud of my decision and generally speaking, the market would reward me or, or take care of me for having made such a tough call, you know, and so I felt like it was the right thing to do. So now continuing on the story, um, what happened after that was uh, I, you know, because we leveled the compensation and had an appropriate ban for compensation, I was able to recruit talent. Now I post a job rec and I, I, I didn't know this until many, many months later, but what I found was that we were hiring great talent, many of which were from internal at the company, internal at Tesla. And uh, now fast forward about a year later. Um, there's a couple things that happened over the course of that year. Uh, I had become fairly aware of the idea of, uh, of biases being brought into the workplace, unconscious biases. It's a term that you probably are all, you know, use every day. I use it once every, you know, two years, honestly. Right. And um, I found that there were a lot of moments where female team members were being interrupted as they were speaking by male team members. Um, there were moments when there would be a very casual reference, you know, we'd be in the thick of things. Everything was going to hell. You know, we're, we're working really hard late at night. And, you know, somebody would just say something very casually like, can't we just get a guy to come in here and solve this problem? You know, can't we just get a... Uh, uh, you know, let's, let's hire a guy to, to, to do some machine learning on this and that, right? And I kept on hearing this word guy, you know, being, being referred to, or there's a man over here who's, you know, going to come in here and solve this. And I thought to myself, like, if I was a female, I'd probably take somewhat of offense to this, you know? And so uh, both, both sides of it. One is the reference to guy for everything. And then two is being interrupted along the way, you know, when you're presenting your point. And so I just took a personal, you know, tone in my team meetings where I would make sure that if someone were interrupted, I would intentionally go back to that person and say, Sarah, you were making a point before Bob interrupted you. Can you please finish your point? Which sent a message to Sarah that I'm attentive to the fact that Bob interrupted her and as well sent a message to Bob that it's not okay to interrupt anyone, you know, especially Sarah. And then everyone else in the meeting knew that that was not okay to interrupt people. So it was just my way. It was just like my pet peeve of having, you know, people interrupt, uh, you know, someone else or interrupt me. So how did your peers react to that? They don't know about it. They wouldn't know about it because it was just, it was all my team, my, team, my division and environment. It was the tone that I was setting and the culture that I was setting in my division. So what happened over that year, and I didn't know this until a year had elapsed, was that the number of people we hired from within Tesla was pretty substantial. So people who already employed at Tesla and they were coming over to my group. 
And uh, I, I looked at the numbers um, during our next annual performance cycle. And there were a couple things that stood out. So now I'll give you the punchline of this whole story. Um, that team of eight people, it grew to be 43 in one year. All right, so that's about five, five times you know, size of growth. The end result was that the total number of females on the team was 53% of that 43 person team, okay? There were nine leads of the team, so nine direct reports of mine five of which were female, makes 55% female. The compensation delta between male and female across all 43 people was 1.1%. I won't even tell you which direction it was favorable because it doesn't matter at 1%. No. And it was 14% visa holders, which is the reflection of international status. By the way, at the inception at eight people, it was 0% visa holders. So here it was 14% at the end. And so I started to try to understand what happened. Why? Because mind you, you know, I'm not focused on you know, diversity as my main charter. I'm focused on building digital products to scale Tesla for the Model 3 delivery. You don't necessarily think about diversity every day in that context. And so um, I started to understand it better. And it turns out the two females, the ones who got 40 and 66% on their pay increase, they were often asked by others within the company, how's your new manager would be the question they're asked. How is your new manager? And they would answer back with, I would imagine a variety of things, you know, maybe some negative, I don't know. But amongst the list that they would respond back with, they would talk about, you know, the fact that the pay, the pay equity is being achieved in this team. They would most likely talk about how I was weeding out the unconscious bias references, people being interrupted, references to guys, etc. And lo and behold, what I didn't realize was that if we had a job rec open and we had eight candidates for that job, roughly speaking, about four of those candidates were female. And many of those four females were referrals from the initial two females on the team. Wow. Right. Not surprising. Not surprising that you received the referrals, but accolades on the numbers. I mean. Thank you. Thank you. And so then I realized that this word of mouth had basically taken hold where these two females were either responding to questions or proactively speaking to people saying, you want to come over to this team because he cares about you know, diversity, you know, overall. And, uh, you know, if you, if you think about it logically, you know, a lot of people talk about diversity and say, well, my candidate pipeline is, you know, 10 males. And so no wonder why we have, you know, males on the team or 10 people from, you know, Harvard, Yale and, and Wharton. And then therefore, you know, we're all Ivy League, you know, type reference. Um, when in, in reality, in my case, uh, because we created a culture of inclusion, that's what attracted the talent because the team members who were on the team attracted others, you know, who would want to be part of it. And so my candidate pool is representative of the male female uh, gender split, you know, it's roughly 50%, you know, along the way. And so then, you know, I started to, you know, I didn't fully realize the impact of the story. Christine had highlighted this story to me, you know, later. Um, but then there were other forms of diversity that came to mind. And so uh, I started thinking a lot about academic diversity, you know, as a very key point. And that's a very big hot button for me. So keep in mind, I went to schools that were not considered top tier. All right. So Cal State Northridge, if anyone knows Cal State Northridge in the Los Angeles area, um, it is in the shadow of UCLA and USC. And my graduate school is Boston University, which is, you know, uh, arguably in the shadow of Harvard and MIT in many cases. And uh, only in the last year or two when, you know, the, 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 the term varsity blues college cheating scandal has come up, um, that this has become a real hot button for me because there were many times in my own career where I had heard from companies that would say, sorry, we only recruit from these 10 schools. And they would be Stanford and Harvard and Wharton and you fill in the rest with the, the brands that you know of. And so that just, you know, prevented the ability for any candidates, regardless of their abilities, qualities and so on, you know, to make it through. And for me in particular, what I found was that uh, I went to Cal State Northridge from 93 to 97. And in 94, there was a massive earthquake that destroyed, frankly, you know, the college campus. 
And we, you know, as students found a way to um, make it through the day. And, you know, the, any form of positive energy or campus life was simply sucked out the day that earthquake happened. But what I didn't realize what we learned was the principle of resiliency. And that was figuring out how to make it through the tough times. And so when at Tesla, when you're there at 2 a.m. on Sunday morning with Elon in the depths of the factory trying to solve some problem and everyone's tired, everyone's frustrated with each other, you don't like the people you're around because you've been around them so long and he's yelling at you for something that probably isn't even your fault, frankly. Um, you know, there's certain people who would not be able to handle that kind of environment if they've not faced adversity in their life. And so in my form, you know, the Northridge earthquake was a moment in time at the right time of my life where there was tremendous adversity that I faced. And it taught me this principle or building the muscle of how to make it through, you know, these, these tough times and see a better day. And I, I fear that there's people who might be given too much privilege, you know, as part of, uh, well, let's just say it honestly, their parents paid their way into school, you know, into a top tier school, uh, feeling like their career would be, you know, better benefited by that, that they've not had to earn it. They've not faced that adversity and challenge to make it through because they had somebody um, greasing the wheels, you know, to get them through it. And when it, you know, if I were to hire one of those people, then at two in the morning, they won't be reachable, frankly, let alone be in the trenches with you, you know, solving that problem. And so I've taken the torch of, you know, looking for academic diversity as another pillar of the stool of diversity, not only gender, not only ethnicity, but then academic diversity, uh, because I want the differing opinions and perspectives that have people investing, you know, based on their experiences in our, in our success. So Christina, I'll pause there. You've heard my story and I'm sure there's elements that, you know, were, were hot buttons that you want to talk more about um, that, that are appropriate for your audience. I'll give you a chance to navigate the conversation from here. One, well, every time we have conversations, I learn more stuff. So, you know, there's a lot. That was, I guess we were maybe 25 minutes and there was a lot of information in there. But right before everybody joined the call, we were talking a little bit too about this you know, the, the scandal with, with Ivy Lake schools. And you know, I've got to tell you, after, I'm not even going to tell you how many years I've been in the employment industry, I do believe there's a job for every person and a person for every job. The resiliency side, though, I think ties to innovation, right? And, and I also, you know, no shame about this, support dreamers 100%. My, my father was a first-generation immigrant from Italy. He was an entrepreneur chief manager of the Apollo Atlantic. So I kind of lived through this Italian entrepreneur guy and, and felt like I had a lot of, didn't know it by the way. I think when, when you're in the middle of those adverse moments that make it, you know, when you, when you are the guy who's one down, and, you know, my family always says it has to do with being the second child, you do become resilient and that resilience pays off. I guess I wonder now when I look at some of our, so our startups and our mid-market companies, resiliency is key. I mean. You know, like you mentioned at, at Tesla, how are you going to get there if, if you can't be scrappy? Because you've got to be. I, and I wonder too, and I would put this out to our, our participants uh, in the webinar, when a company is more mature, is that the place for somebody who maybe hasn't developed that muscle that Parag is talking about, that resiliency muscle? Because, the, you know, there's still, besides people that just get in because of privilege, um, I think there's a, t a time and a place for all different kinds of hires. I think the more, the further down this rabbit hole of diversity we go, the more I'm noticing that we have so many biases, you know? And I think that, uh, actually, I, I was just sharing that Visual Capitalist, which is an infographic company that, that publicizes five times a week different infograms, and they put one out just the week before last, uh, 50 types of implicit bias. And it was craziness. It, it was craziness. Like, well, I'll give you an example in an interviewing phase. So, um, and actually it was Laszlo Block of, of Google who did a presentation a few years ago talking about um, how long it took for a group of juniors at, um, I think it was University of Topeka. So they, they did a, University of, of Topeka did a, a study where they took college level juniors and they put them behind a mirror to watch interviews. And then they asked them, after the interview, you know, after they saw it, how, who got hired and who didn't. And, and the Topekans had an over 
ratio of getting it right. I mean, they really did a good job at it. And then Laszlo puts it out to the group and says, well, you know, how long of, of the interview did you think they watched? And they actually got to watch 10 seconds. So, you know, juniors in college watching 10 seconds of an interview were able to predict at a higher rate than most who would get hired. Um, and then, you know, when you take that information and, and having watched interviews myself and that being a big part of, of what we do to help look at how the interview process in general is going, you know, it can be as simple as, Parag, you take the train, I take the train, you come in for the interview, you're a few minutes later a little ruffled and you say, hey, Christine, I, you know, I take the train, I believe in, in tra public trans and it just ran a little late. And I'm like, oh. in my brain, I'm a trainer, I've got a trainer. Now I'm going to unconsciously weed you in as compared to weed you out. So my biases are gonna, my unknown biases are gonna kick in. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's one thing when we can figure out what the big buckets are, right? Which are, you know, women, people of color, um, different oranges or, or origin, you know, origination places. Those are a little bit simpler to find. I think as we go further along and we start to really take a look at what it is we're doing, that'll start to change too. Mm -hmm. You know, one, one question I often get is, um, you know, not being from diversity, inclusion, or HR, why, why is this topic on my mind? Where'd it come from? You know, and, uh, and, and I feel like um, there's two stories I can point to. So uh, the, clearly the one about feeling, you know, somewhat disadvantaged from the brand name schools that I came from. Um, number two was a fascinating story of my origin. So uh, I was born in Los Angeles spend most of my life there. And my parents had immigrated from India uh, to the U US in roughly 1970 or so. And um, I, I believe, I've never talked to them about this, but I believe they made a decision to, uh, uh, to say, we're gonna raise our kids in, in America and we're gonna assimilate to what it means to be an American uh, rather than preserve our culture and you know, distance ourselves from what it means to be American. So, you know, I, I do believe that I'm the all-American kid. You know, I played soccer and t-ball and Boy Scouts. I was in a fraternity in college. I mean, heck, I worked for the Walt Disney Company, which is not, there's not too much more American than that. And Microsoft, right, and eBay, like uh, StubHub, right? These are American things. They don't exist, you know, largely in, in too many other places. And, uh, you know, I, I found myself in, in, you know, the early days in, in soccer and t-ball and so on is there's a, you know, the, the, the boys soccer team would be you know, Mike and, and Paul and, and Rob and, and Timmy. And then there's this kid named Parag and it's a very unusual name. And, you know, the only one who's different amongst the team photo, but I didn't notice it, you know, didn't, didn't strike me as being odd. It was just, you know, the way it was. So one day I come home from uh, school by nine young years old or so. And uh, all my friends were, you know, of certain origin. So I tell my mom, I said, you know, all my friends go to this thing on Tuesday, Thursday. I want to start going to it. And that thing was Hebrew school. <laughs> and so uh, I said to my mom, I want to go to Hebrew school. And she looked at me and said, sure. I'll talk to the neighbors, you know, mom, and maybe she can take you. I literally started going to Hebrew school. You know, here I am in Indian kid, you know, first generation, uh, born in LA, speaking Yiddish, and I'm going to Hebrew school. I'm I'm doing you know the Hanukkah with the family next door, right? Well, so it just gets as just gets ready for questions because I think she's going to start nudging me in a second. Yeah. I do have a question for you. So as you're interviewing people for your team, yeah. you know, is there any questions or anything that you look for that? is gonna give you the information to see if they're like you, right? Are they inclusive? Are, are they resilient? Can they be emphatic? Do they get it? Is there any trick to how you do that? You know, there is not, Christine. I, I, the phrase that I use, and it's not gonna be the answer to your question, but the thing I look for is intellectual curiosity. Okay, and what I've distilled it down to is that if, if a person is curious to not give up on the pursuit of the answer to the question, then they're exhibiting the traits of someone who, um, you know, does not give up. And if they do not give up, they may have incurred, incurred some type of adversity in their life that has developed that muscle that has them saying, I'm not going to give up. I'm not expecting anything to be handed to me. You know, I'm going to go get what I want and I'm going to have to work for it. And I recognize I have to work for it. 
that is the principle. And I think, you know, from, for me, if that person can exhibit those traits and I'll ask a bunch of questions to try to figure that out, that would then transcend into personal stories that frankly, I'm not even comfortable asking about the personal stories in an interview because it suggests that you might be looking for things either positively or negatively. So I distill it down to intellectual curiosity is my single attribute that is emblematic of having a, you know, a well-rounded person. I love it. Just writing it down. Jess, are, are we ready for some questions? Yes. There she is. This is Jess Ogardo, everybody. Hi, Jess. Good afternoon. Great conversation. And thank you so much, Parag, for sharing your story. Very inspiring. Okay, the first question that we have for today. How do you make diversity and inclusion a priority with your leadership team? Any suggestions for that? You know, I've always believed actions speak louder than words. And so when and where you're in a position where you have the ability to action and then have that be the representation of uh, your words, you're coming in from a stronger perspective. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, when, when you're in the senior leadership ranks, as I was, you know, at Tesla, um, it's, it's not a topic that arises very often. So if I were to think about it differently, so I clearly acted upon it at Tesla. And then, you know, I, I got a chance to see what the reaction was from the rest of the leaders. If I were to do it differently, I would say, I would tell my story to the HR lead who's in the room mm -hmm. and, you know, ask that we make that a topic of conversation and happy to be a case study based on my actions. You know, and here's the result that happened. We attracted talent, we retained people longer, you know, whatever it was. Um, yeah, I think that's how I would do it. Um, but it, it's, it's a, you know, it's a very difficult topic because if you show up on in your early in a team at the senior level and you start talking about, you know, diversity, um, you may not have the foundation to be standing upon, which is the success of your division. Mm -hmm. you know, if you can talk about it from the perspective of success of your division, as well as achieving this, you know, d diverse team set and point to that is the reason why the team has been successful. Then you have a case study to encourage others to follow uh, a similar suit. Okay. Did you have the opportunity to do that then? Did you have the opportunity to say, look, this team is successful because of its diversity or the, the key element? Christine, the short answer is no. And it was not because of anything other than the dynamics at Tesla at the time. There was, uh, you know, a lot of churn and a lot of fluidity, you know, to the team that, you know, there was, um, there was more confusion than, than clarity. Um, and these topics, frankly, like, it, maybe it's unfortunate that I would say this, but it feels like these are luxury item to topics to talk about when everything is going sideways. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and so at that time, there were a lot of things going sideways at Tesla. And so, you know, if you, I don't know, if you, if you can't figure out how to deliver 5,000 cars in an infrastructure that can support 2,000 cars, then, you know, you're trying to figure out the solution to that problem. It, it is an inappropriate time to say, you know, what we need is diverse teams. But right. it's okay to say we need some innovation. Yeah, absolutely. So, so drawing that correlation between innovation and diversity becomes even more crucial, right? Yeah, and I think it happens through action. So if you have the diverse team in which you're producing ideas or solutions that are innovative, that are coming from you know, the diverse team, then you may, you may have that leg to stand on. But I think you get my point is that when you're in the thick of it and you have this problem you need to solve the next two hours. More diversity, don't worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's like the person who's, who says, you know, what we really need here is Six Sigma. Let's get everyone trained on Six Sigma, you know? Yeah. That's like six years away. Right. Exactly. You know, from, from being part of the solution to that problem. So I, unfortunately, like, I don't think it's the, there's a, there's a situational side to that story where it was not the right time, you know, to be looking for, I do think of it like it, it unfortunately it seemed like a luxury item in that context. Okay. And speaking of the leadership team at Tesla, how did Elon relax, react to all this? I never told him. I mean, I was, uh, it was <laughs> bottom line. It was a belief that that would not, um, it not, not because he's averse to diversity or anything. He just wants people to be passionate and hardworking. Doesn't care at all what 
you, you look like or, or, or sound like or anything like that. Um, but it was, uh, you know, he, he was singularly focused on the success of sustainability for the planet. Mm -hmm. And that is a storyline and a mission that overtakes any other topic, you know, whether it's how much, how many hours of sleep you got, or, you know, you've got a family reunion to go to, or you have a diverse team. It doesn't matter. The goal is sustainability of the planet, you know, and nothing else matters. And so I kind of, once again, to the similar question of the previous one you asked Jessica, um, situationally, there is not a vehicle or a venue to have that discussion with Elon about this. And frankly, I was thrilled to not have that discussion with him. <laughs> Every day that would go by that, you know, we would not have it um, was better. Now, I, and I, I get the point of the question, which is, if the other were true, if the opposite were true, where he was, if the, the mechanism for that conversation did happen, in which he did embrace it or found it to be a positive thing, it could have permeated throughout the company, you know, for the benefit of, of Tesla. And so maybe I was not strong enough to bring the topic, you know, out into the forefront. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I think, more akin to the actions speak louder than words. And right. so I feel like I've got, you know, a team that grew in size rapidly, representative of diversity, and was producing solutions to problems that, uh, you know, were actually working. And so yeah, if, if even one's... better, right? Like, I don't mean to sound like a groupie, because I'm starting to sound like a groupie, but even better, because this is a natural evolution for you. And, you right. know, touching on that, you're saying, well, Elon's like, he doesn't care, just get it done, he doesn't care what color you are, what gender you are, just, just you know, if you're the best person, get it done. Even, it makes an even better story. Like, I'm almost afraid to educate you, because I like you the way. I like you the way you are. I don't want you to get too far down the diversity thing. Just keep doing the cool stuff you're doing, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now I, it's official. I am a groupie. <laughs> I, I think. I think you're right. It, it is it, because I'm not looking for this topic every day. You know, it's not on my mind as a, a thing to go do. Um, maybe it is more impactful because I'm, you know, just an. an I don't know if the term is silent advocate. You know, for the topic. Um, but I'm not silent because I'm writing a book on this topic and I speak at conferences, which is where Christine and I met. Um, so I think there's folks like you all from, from this organization and, and the folks on this panel who um, might say like this story needs to be bottled up and told so there's other folks who can emulate it. Because frankly, I wasn't trained. I didn't go to school. I didn't uh, you know, get an education from a certificate program on how to achieve diversity in an organization. I just did it organically based on logic, you know, and everyone, you know, faces their own family dynamic. I'm married. I got a daughter, a sister, a mom, like they may have been disadvantaged in their own ways in their career, you know, that I could be part of the solution for so that the next generation doesn't face this, you know, and I'd feel good about that being my legacy. Absolutely. Well, and I think one of the things that's come out of this is the recommendations that we like to make now people to look for we need we need to call it something besides parag uh, but you know look for the parags in your organization because they're there you know we've long said and and, and i think anybody in, in diversity and inclusion at this point will say yeah you know we're looking to bring people up the ranks and look at you know look at what's happening with within the banks right so i think it was morgan came out and said we're you know we're not going to invest in companies that don't have at least two women on their board so, you know, I think people are starting to get it when they see the correlation and the gains. I just think we're like that far off from the gains as compared to the stigma, because getting past the stigma and these biases that actually work against you. You know, if I'm honest, I've had this company for 24 years and it wasn't until the last 10 years that I identified as a woman owned company. We were certified, but you didn't see it in, on our website. You didn't see it in any of our stuff. Because to me, that was kind of like, hey, discriminate against us because we're, you know, we were founded by women. Hmm. Strange times we live in, but exciting times. Mm -hmm. What else we got, Jess? Okay. Can you tell us a way when you are speaking to your female employees, what do you tell them about other managers that are not sensitive and that use bias language? So I, I suppose the, uh, what I've done, so I've, I've been asked that by one person uh, in, in the recent past, um, in the same vein of actions speak louder than words. So, you know, if someone says the type of phrase, can't we hire a guy to come in and go to, you know, solve this problem that we, we have, 
I, I, you know, a very like soft way and appropriate way to respond without, you know, feeling like it's going to get confrontational is to say, um, yes, I think we can hire a qualified person, you know, to be able to, to approach this topic. And I'll take that on and figure out how we can find the right person for this solution. So you've subtly, re you've, you've responded as positively and affirmatively as possible. And you've given, you know, if not one, two references to an alternative phrase to the word guy by saying a qualified person, you know, for this. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's actually for most people, it is a strong enough message that they recognize, you know, that you use that phrase twice in the response. Um, that on average, if you do that as your, your typical response back, it would probably lead to a behavior change. Okay, perfect. So modeling the appropriate verbiage and behavior. All right, next question. So someone is asking, Christine, could you please show Parag's book again? They would like to know the name of it so they can pick up a copy. Tell us about the book real quick, Parag. Yeah, let me tell you one aspect. So it's the team decision matrix. I think if you're looking on Amazon, look for my name. It's probably easier That's to find that. it using my name, Parag Vaish. No, my name. Um, and maybe, Christine, you could send the link out to this group. Um, right, to, yes, we'll include that. In the one, one thing to know about this book in the context of diversity is, um, you know, the essence of this book that Christine just showed is about how you make decisions on prioritizing doing one thing versus any other thing that you can do. So in the course of product management, you might have 100 things you can go do to make your digital experience better and you have capacity to go do five at a time. What I found was that, you know, over my career, the best uh, ideas and ability to execute on them actually came from engineers, not the product manager, designer, and so on. And oftentimes engineers are uh, coming from another country in which English is their second language. And just speaking honestly and frankly, they're often intimidated by fast talking Americans, which by the way, I consider myself to be one of those fast talking Americans. Right. I consider you one of those too. <laughs> and so when you have um, uh, an engineer who's come from another country who, you know, comes from a place where respecting rank and hierarchy and authority has you being, you know, subservient to whoever's in charge. And then you're faced with fast talking American on top of it. You get to a place where you shut down. You say, this person clearly seems to know what they're doing. I can't get in a word in edgewise. You know, and if I did, I would not be able to articulate it as well as this person. So now I'm an intimidated and I'm going to clam up. Right. And so this book describes how I unlocked those people, those people who are, um, you know, soft spoken and use data for defining how you actually get the, you know, extract the value from those people. So you're using data as the discussion point rather than opinion. Because the minute you have an opinion, then your ability to articulate things, your speed of conversation, your inflection of voice becomes the reason why that opinion gets more airtime and more visibility. Okay. This book and this process that we employed at StubHub was to uh, you know, essentially abolish that, but not in a way that was like, hey, all fast talking Americans are not in vogue anymore. Right? It was in a way of saying, let's use data to drive decision making you know, rather than whoever can yell loudest. And that's the, the essence of it. So you can almost say that there's an element of this book, even though it's designed for product management and decision-making that is favoring diverse cultures being brought about. Okay. I'll give you one example, one, one more example of that, just so I can parallel. Yeah. So Amazon has a principle of using uh, documents to kick off their meetings. Mm -hmm. If anyone's worked with folks at Amazon, a 60 minute meeting would very often start with 30 minutes being everyone reading a document, whether it's printed or on your screen. So no words being spoken, 10 people in a room, all of which are reading a document. It's very awkward, you know, especially if you've not been in that culture, but in that culture, it's ideal because you have people who might have English as their second language, all the things I just mentioned, but they, uh, they would, if you do that 30 minutes of everyone being on the same page with reading and articulating, these people can understand it just as well as anyone else who can read. And so then they can be laser focused on their specific point. That is the most important point. And everyone's coming from the same position rather than if you have a slide presentation of 10 slides, then your question might be answered in slide eight, but you're stuck on slide three because everyone's rat hold on your points. So it's a way of leveling the playing field for not only presentation delivery, but for anyone who's feeling intimidated by the environment, 
they can you know converse based on a strong foundation of having the complete information all at once. I, I believe that actually gives Amazon you know a long term talent acquisition differentiator that will work that has worked for them and will continue to work. Okay. Really <laughs> builds towards inclusion. Mm -hmm. That is inclusive. Mm -hmm. We do have one attendee saying, I want to hire Parag to speak to my company. So we'll put you in connection with Parag. And then we also have someone that has asked, will this recording be sent to all participants today? And yes, you will be receiving an email after today's presentation with the link to the webinar. And if you did want to see um, videos of my presentations, if you go to paragvesh.com, um, you would see videos on both the book that was just mentioned and how I present that on stage, as well as the presentation Christine saw um, about a year ago. Okay, perfect. And we're, we're thinking about doing a road show. <laughs> thinking about doing a road I have some engagements coming up. Maybe I can get, maybe I can get a frog to come to like the Midwest in the heart of the winter and <laughs> do the road show with me. But, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we can join together and, and do some other things. So we'll certainly get you in touch with frog. Um, the link will be included. How are we doing question-wise? Anything else there, Jess, that we need to talk about? No, we answered all the questions. Thank you. Cool. Well, feel free to submit more. Thank you, my friend, for joining. Such great work you've done just being you, which is pretty cool. Um, again, I think, you know, we're looking for within our partners, we're, and I'm always looking at people science with the other frogs that we can bring to the forefront because I think that's really where we're going to move the needle with inclusion. Thank you for joining um, and I look forward to talking to you again soon Parag and again you know we'll be sending the email soon so you know we might even put a group together on LinkedIn or, or Facebook to continue the conversation but we'll, we'll keep in touch with you about that. Thank you. That's great. Thank you all. Thank you all for the dialogue. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>